Good afternoon and welcome to Google I.O. Thank you for coming to this session. I'm Brad Abrams. I'm a product manager on the Cloud Platform team. And I'm Andy Waite. I'm a developer advocate uh, on the Google Cloud Platform. And in this session, we're going to give you a whirlwind tour of the Google Cloud Platform. What I love about I.O. is we get to talk about what's next. Not just what's next for Google or what's next for the cloud, but what's next for all of us as developers. And as software developers, we know that we're in one of the most high stakes, critical, creative industries on the planet. And it's that way because our users, uh, the people that use our apps, continually push us to build better software faster. Users want our applications to be highly available 24 hours a day, seven days a week in every geo around the world. And those users demand our applications be fast and responsive. Our studies have shown draw, uh, latency on the orders of tens or hundreds of milliseconds can have a significant drop off rate and engagement on your apps. And increasingly, users want to be delighted by having you predict and suggest to offer them things before they even know they need them. So whether you're at an enterprise or you're at a startup or you work at Google, we all face the same challenge. And that is we want to build better software faster. So let's talk about how the Google Cloud Platform helps you build that better software faster. With GCP, we're building a different kind of cloud. Some of you may be familiar with the status quo clouds, and they share a lot in common with colo data centers of the past. Now, you may not be physically plugging in network cables or switching out hard drives, but you're still doing a lot of unproductive infrastructure work. Uh, and that's time that could be better spent focused on your application, the unique value you have. Google used to have a data center uh, cloud like that internally up until about 10 years ago. And user demand really spiked. Our usage really started spiking on all our apps. And we realized we just couldn't keep up with the scale with that kind of data center. And so today, if you're a Googler on Gmail or YouTube or apps, if you're a developer on one of those, you may never write a deployment script but your application may be deployed over hundreds, uh, or hundreds or even thousands of instances. You may never spin up an instance or even SSH into one, but your application is uh, used by tens of millions of people every day. And you may never write a failover code, but your applications are some of the most highly reliable applications on the internet. And that's because we've rethought what it is to be a cloud from top to bottom. And it's that journey that we're on with the Google Cloud Platform to, make, to have you be able to use the exact same infrastructure tools and services that we use internally. And that's what we think of as this third wave of cloud computing. And to help you get a sense, a really hands-on sense as developers, there's nothing like code to help you understand. So in order to do that, Mandy and I, over the course of this talk, are going to build an app. And it's the next hit mobile game called Photo Scavenger Hunt. And we're launching it here at this event. You can go to the Play Store right now and download it. Um, the way it works is you're given four clues. And then you go out into the real world and take pictures of items to try to match those clues. And when you match the clues, you get the points associated with it. Um, the architecture of the application is very simple. Uh, there's an Android and, and iOS client application. Now, there's a lot of talks here at I.O. talking about the client app, so we're not going to spend a lot of time there, although that's very important. What we're going to do is focus on the server side of the app. So the server side of the app is an App Engine app written in Node.js. How many Node.js developers do we have here? OK, a good number. Um, uh, most of what we're showing works in many, many other languages, PHP, Python, Ruby, Java. So if you use other languages, you can apply almost everything we're showing. We, uh, the photo gets uploaded, and it's stored in cloud storage. And that's our object storage, highly reliable, highly available object storage. We store a state about the game in Google's NoSQL database called Cloud Data Store. 
And then we do the smarts of it with the Vision API, where we apply the same sort of machine, we use exactly the same machine learning technology that's used in the Google Photos app. It's available to you as a developer, and we're going to show you how that works. So I think the best way, though, to understand this app is actually to see a demo. So can we switch over to the demo machine, to the phone? And are we seeing it? Yeah. And no. Can we switch to this? OK, he's working on switching to this. So while we're waiting, um, how many of you are already using Google Cloud Platform, App Engine, or Compute Engine or something? OK, good. And how many are using another cloud provider? <laughs> good number of you. So thank you for coming. I appreciate you being open-minded about your cloud choices. Certainly the future, I think, is in heterogeneous clouds. And hopefully you'll see that in this demo. All right, so for this demo, you have to download the app and do it yeah, yourself. All you need to do is download <laughs> the app. Uh, should we press on and come back to this? Give him one more minute. Why don't we? Yeah, so he's going to keep working on it. While he's working on it, Mandy, Mandy's going to show how to actually build the application. And we'll, we'll pop back and show you the app. Right, OK, so I need to get in here. OK, so uh, you haven't seen the app, but it is really impressive, unless you've downloaded it, in which case you're playing with it now. Uh, and it's really awesome. So uh, we're going to use, uh, well, we're going to do some live coding, basically. I'm going to use snippets, though. I'm going to cheat, because uh, my cutting and pasting is really laborious. Also, my typing is terrible, so uh, I just make mistakes all over the place, and it wouldn't work. Uh, how many of you are using Sublime Text uh, as a developer tool? Fantastic. How many of you are using Atom? Nice. OK, right, good. So I used to use Atom, but I'm using Sublime again now. OK, so here we have a very simple Node.js application. Uh, we have all of our uh, requires at the top here. We won't get too much detail about those. Uh, what we care about is doing development for Google Cloud Platform. Oh, should we do the, do the app real quick? Oh, yeah, OK. Let's okay, go for it. Great. And then we'll switch right back to her, honestly. OK, so as I mentioned, he's you always get, stealing my thunder. <laughs> you, get, you get four clues. Um, in this case, person. Sorry, let me leave it. Person, wedding ring, flower, dog. Does anybody have a dog I could take a, <laughs> a flower? OK, how about I use person? So I'm just going to click on person. Um, OK, sorry. I'm just going to click on person. OK, just one sec. Oh, and now the app. OK, OK. He wrote it, by the way. OK. It wasn't me. Unbelievable. OK, we're going to come back to the demo for a different reason. OK, press on. All right. OK. I'll fix it. Uh, do you want to use mine? Yeah, <laughs> do, do, we, do, we can do yours if you want. Yeah, OK. Uh... So we, that's the benefit of Android and iOS. No? Wow. Technical difficulties everywhere. OK. There you go. OK. So. Um, so what, I'm going to click on person and uh, take my selfie on stage here. So I switch the camera, and I take my selfie. And then I'll put it here. And what's happening now? Hopefully you can see. I'm sorry about my fingerprints on my phone. So what we're doing now is sending that. I hope this works. Uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> hey, you guys have killed the internet. We send it up to the server, and then it comes back and tells us what it found in the image. Let's yeah, just press let's, on. Let's talk about how it so does Switch that, right? back to the. All right, OK. So uh, we have some Node.js code here. Uh, and what we're going to do is use a, something called the Google Cloud Client Library, uh, which gives very, very simple programmatic access to pretty much everything in Google Cloud Platform. OK? And it's really, really easy to use. Uh, these libraries are handcrafted, and are, they are very idiomatic. Uh, we had them for seven languages. Uh, and when you develop with them, it feels very, very comfortable and very, very second nature, very similar to what you would do normally when you're developing uh, in that language, which isn't always the case with APIs. Uh, the first thing we need to do is actually, well, we've actually installed uh, this client library called gcloud, npm install gcloud before. Uh, and now what we need to do is require gcloud. And that gives us back an object that we can use to access all of Google Cloud Platform services. Uh, we've also done some uh, credential munging here as well. We've set an environment variable with a key file, a file that contains uh, some JSON code uh, that contains our credentials. So it's very much 
very, very much uh, to simplify the authentication process. The authentication process is really simple. So once we have this object now, what we can do is go to step two, and we can get a reference to Google Cloud Storage. And we're going to use Google Cloud Storage to basically, uh, when the app's working, uh, which it will be soon, uh, basically to upload images uh, from the phone, from the application, uh, and so that we can then pass it onto the Cloud Vision API, uh, which will do the processing. For this, we call cloud gcloud.storage, and we get a uh, reference back to an object called storage, which we can use uh, to make calls on. Uh, we also access a bucket. Uh, this is uh, cloud storage. It's an object-based store for uh, large amounts of unstructured data. Uh, and to access it, we need buckets. Uh, so we have a bucket we've created earlier. I'm passing this in through the environment uh, with an envir environment variable called upload bucket. Uh, so we call storage.bucket and then the name, and we get back a reference to our bucket. In step three, which is the first part of our API. So we've only got a simple part of the API that the application calls here. Uh, and this is the API image and the game ID. Uh, the game ID will use randomly throughout the talk, uh, but that's the API we're going to call. And we're going to be basically uploading a photograph to that, a picture that's taken from the app. And to do that, to get started, very simply, uh, in this case, very simply, because I just typed step three, we type in a few lines of code. So basically, we create a, a storage path variable, which is the path where we're going to store the uploaded image. And then we create an options object, uh, which contains that information. Uh, then we can just simply call bucket.upload at the path of the file that's been uploaded. We're using Malta in Node.js, uh, which does the uploads for us. And then we're passing in the op options object and a callback function. Uh, ultimately, that will upload the file. If there's a problem, we'll get the error back, and we can uh, uh, express that back to the console. Or in this case, we're just going to say console.log uploaded to cloud storage. And so I'm going to save that and then go to my terminal here. And I'm going to run nodemon appdemo.js. And so basically, we're listening uh, for changes to that application using Nodemon. Uh, what we can do now is send an image, uh, very much in the same way as the application would do. Uh, in this case, we have we decided to go for something, uh, an image that's fairly aggressive. Uh, you know what raccoons are like? Uh, we don't have raccoons in the UK, but you have them here. And they're quite scary, right? Uh, raccoons, yeah? Apparently. So uh, what we need is a raccoon picture, right? OK, so let's use the raccoon picture, uh, which is this one. I think it's a little bit scary. So. <laughs> all right, so okay, maybe not so scary, right? Okay, all right. So we use this one. Uh, and what we do is we'll send, emit a very simple curl command to our endpoint uh, locally. And we'll send this now. And nothing much is going to happen because we're just uploading the file. I didn't actually close the response, but we do get our message printed. Upload into cloud storage. Ah, file, object. I should have actually done a string on that. Okay, so we've uploaded a file. Very, very simple. The next thing we want to do is call the Cloud Vision API. And to do that, we need an access to the Cloud Vision API. So the Cloud Vision API effectively allows us to process images, send images into the cloud, and then get information about what the Cloud Vision API effectively sees within that image. And that's effectively content description. Uh, content detection, uh, and also classification. Uh, we can look for things like labels, common objects. We can do uh, landmarks. We can OCR text. We can also detect facial expressions as well. And if you go to the Cloud Sandbox, uh, we have an Emoto booth that will take your picture and detect uh, whether you're happy or sad, uh, which most people can do already anyway. So I'm not sure what the big deal is. Uh, is right? uh, so what we need to do here is get a reference to our Vision API. Oh, also, we can uh, detect inappropriate content that's been sent up as well. So if anybody sends rude pictures, we can detect that. OK, uh, so for this, we need a reference to the Vision API. And that's step four. gcloud.vision gives us a reference back to an object we can use. And then we do step five, which is, oh, surprise, surprise, step five. And here we have some more code. Uh, we set up an arguments object, a JSON object. And we're going to use two specific features. One is the label detection feature of uh, Cloud Vision API. The other is the safe search detection. Now, label detection detects things within the image, like raccoons, angry raccoons. We could do facial expressions on, the, on a raccoon, right? We should do that. Yeah. Uh, so, so, 
Safe search detection will look for inappropriate content, okay, and flag it if it's there. And the source, uh, image source is just the uh, path to the file. This is the file that's stored in Google Cloud Storage. And we use GS colon slash slash as the currency for internal URLs within Google Cloud Platform. And then we can then simply call vision.annotate, uh, and we pass in the arguments object, and we get back a results object. And then if we have a problem, we echo to the error, uh, to the console. We do some cleanup. We have uh, some cheating code here, uh, label cleanup, which actually does some cleanup on the response. Uh, but then we basically have a labels object, which we can stringify and return back to the user. OK, so let's try that out. And what we can do is go back to our console. And yeah, update available. That's very nice. <laughs> I did in the wrong place. We'll that later. I? I meant to do that in here. It's very easy to panic when you're doing demos, right? OK, so we have our node mon running again. And we can send our angry raccoon picture again. In this case, we get back a response from the Vision API. And let's compare that to the photograph. So we have a mammal, 96% confidence, 95% chance it's a, an animal, and 94% chance it's a raccoon. And down at the bottom here, uh, it's very unlikely to be adult content. Although, this could be considered adult content to raccoons. <laughs> I'm not sure. Possible. Also, medical violence, so we can detect that kind of thing for us. We're not acting on that information, but we could do. Do you act on it in the code? I don't. I, okay. I do, actually. I do. Good. OK. So Test that's me on it. The last part is to store the labels. Now, the application is quite interesting that it learns, basically, from the images that you upload. So every time you upload an image, it detects the labels, and we store the labels. And then we use those labels to seed the game. So the, the things you see, the four options you see in the game, are labels from images that people have uploaded beforehand. So it's quite interesting the way it works. It's very, very dynamic. Uh, so in order to store the labels, we need to store them uh, somewhere safe, uh, maybe a, a NoSQL non-relational store that scales massively, something like Google Cloud Data Store. Uh, and to access that, we just do gcloud.datastore to get a reference back to the data store. And down here, we can very simply make calls to that. We iterate across the result, uh, results objects here uh, using a map. We pull out the label, uh, then we create a key, and then we look into the data store to say, do you have this key? Uh, if we get a response back saying yes, uh, we will increment. I haven't actually implemented the code. We will increment the counter on that label. Uh, if we don't get the label back, we will create the label with a count of one and push it back to the data store. And so that way, the game is constantly learning. And the last thing we do is very quickly, because Brad's getting impatient. I mean, <laughs> Uh, we'll quickly run that again. We've saved the updates, and we'll run the curl command again. And this time, we get the same results back. But now we can see here, we've actually got the labels pulled out from the response. We will now store those uh, directly. And that's pretty much it for that. What yep. we're going to do now is deploy the application to Google App Engine for the next section. And for this, I'm going to use a tool called Cloud SDK. Uh, which gives a command called gcloud. And this is the one-stop shop for everything Google Cloud Platform when it comes to uh, managing stuff. Uh, and I'm going to type in preview app deploy minus minus version oops alpha. We have many versions, but we're using two specific versions. Mine is alpha 1. Uh, and we're going to say, yes, that's good. it, right? OK. So now we're going to push this to the Google App Engine, and Brad's going to take over. Actually, so let's switch back to the demo. We'll ask Tom ah, right, back yeah. to the, the screen. Do we have it? OK, so there we are. You can see you got the iOS working. Um, it, it knew with confidence that I'm a person, so 95% confident that I'm a person. So it uses the same call she just did. And then it also found that I'm a man, and apparently it likes my glasses. So there we go. OK, so let's switch back to the demo machine. And we have this application deployed in uh, production now. And you, it, it, you're ready to start thinking about where you're going to deploy your application. So as a developer, um, you, yeah, so you're ready to think about where to deploy the app. So as we've already, let me just jump into the demo. We've already shown deploying it to App Engine. And in fact, earlier today, um, uh, Mandy deployed that to App Engine, and we ran a little load test on it. So uh, all, you did, all you do with App Engine is write your source code, deploy it up, and then we handle all. It's a complete no-ops environment. So you don't have to do anything around configuring the database, managing the servers, or anything. Uh, and you can see we uh, spiked up 
uh, to, what is this, 30 or 40 queries per second. And what's nice about that is we scaled up and we scaled down. So you didn't have to think about how many machines should I provision? How much is this going to cost? What should my load be? As the load came up, more machines came up. And when the load went away, the machines went away. So that's quite nice. Uh, another really cool feature of App Engine is App Engine versions. So um, uh, what I'll mention in a minute is that we did this alpha uh, I wrote an Alpha 2 version. You saw the version Mandy wrote with Alpha 1. Um, I wrote an Alpha 2 version, but uh, Mandy's version is getting all the traffic. So if I wanted to, I could migrate traffic to this. Whoops, sorry. I could split traffic to it. And um, the way that works is I can just scale it up. So I could, if I'm doing an A-B test, or actually the way we deploy every binary at Google and our servers is a staged rollout. Start at 1%. Go to 10%, and that makes it make sure it's a safe uh, rollout. Uh, and then the last thing to show here is in container, uh, the Google Container Registry. So when at, when Mandy deployed that app, what happened is we actually pushed the source code up to the server. Uh, and then in a clean, hermetic environment, we built the Node.js app into a container image and then deployed that to the Google Container Registry. And then App Engine grabbed it out of the Container Registry and deployed it onto that whole fleet of machines. We had, I think, 30 or 40 machines going uh, during that load test. Uh, and so that means that this container image is available right here in the Container Registry right now. That seems a little bit like magic to me. It, oh, App Engine is magical. It's as a developer, you focus on your code and Google handles the rest. OK, well, sometimes I want to have a little bit more control, though. I want to actually control more of this and the way you it don't works. don't like the magic. Doing the scaling manually, all of that stuff. I want to take care of it myself, right? I see. I see. I know a lot of developers want more control, and so that's why we have Kubernetes. I, I see Kubernetes. you're wearing a Kubernetes t shirt. Kubernetes. How many of you are using Kubernetes? How many of you have heard of Kubernetes? OK. All right. A few. Kubernetes is the next big thing. All right. Right, OK, so what we have, we have an image. Uh, the image that we just uploaded, uh, and default alpha 1 is our app and version. Uh, and here it is in the container registry. So this is a private registry uh, to Google Cloud Platform, to your project specifically. And what we have is many different images. The latest version is this one, deployed one minute ago. Uh, and that was created effectively by the container builder. And if we select that, what we see here is a show pull command. Uh, this means we can pull the image down from the, re from the registry, just like you would do from hub.docker.com if you were developing a Docker app. Uh, and what we can do is we can click on this, uh, show pull command. And the pull command effectively will pull it down locally uh, where we can run it. Uh, in this case, it's uh, gcloud docker pull instead of docker pull because we need to do some authentication. Uh, this is a secure registry, so we don't want anybody accessing it. Uh, so in this case, we do gcloud to do the auth for us. We also have this thing called running cloud shell. And running cloud shell will start up a shell in the cloud, uh, in your browser effectively, that's associated with your Google Cloud Platform credentials. Uh, from this, you can access all of your projects, all of the things you have running in your projects, and a complete tool chain, including Docker. And what we have uh, also deployed is a Kubernetes cluster. And I'll mention what Kubernetes is in, in a second. So here we have gcloud docker pull, and then the path to the image that was uploaded by my deployment. And I can just do. Pause for G OK, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. And I can just hit that, and it would now deploy. So what is Kubernetes? Kubernetes effectively allows us to run uh, our containers uh, anywhere. OK? And containers are hard to manage. Once you finally get what containers are, you start containerizing everything, and you end up with a lot of them. Uh, and you need some way to manage all of that complexity. Uh, and Kubernetes does all of that for you. So effectively, you'll create container images, and you'll say to Kubernetes, run this for me, and it will run it for you. And that's what we're going to do now. Uh, we have a container cluster, which we created earlier. It's called main cluster. It has four nodes uh, and four CPUs, one node per machine. OK, so can you see that? Is it too small or too big? Or too big, can't be too big, right? <laughs> OK, so in order to use this, uh, we're not going to go into the details of Kubernetes, but there is a talk on Friday. Uh, Carter Morgan is going to be talking about Kubernetes in detail. And you should go along to that talk if you want to find out more. Uh, but in this case, we just do uh, Control R. I'm going to use the history, because we have this thing called a deployment, which effectively manages our running containers for us. And now we're going to do a run. Uh, 
Well done. Kube CTL run, and then name of it, the application, which is PSH, and then the path to the image, and also a port number in this case. Uh, Kube CTL is the command for all operations within Kubernetes on the command line. OK, so we hit that, and we've created a deployment. So now if I go back up and do get deployments again, we see we have one created. So this is basically created one instance of that image that we created from the App Engine deployment. So this is the App Engine app that we've built, now running on Kubernetes. It's not ready yet. Uh, it says zero available. OK. And now it's got one available. So that container is now up and running. Uh, so what we can do now is it, that's great. We had that container running in our cluster somewhere. Uh, we don't really know where it is. We have four machines. We've let the Kubernetes take care of that for us. What we need to do now is be able to access it as a service. Uh, and we have a very uh, simple uh, construct called a service uh, to give, that, give us that access. And we can do control R, expose. And this command will eff effectively expose that running container uh, to other services within our cluster. It will give us an internal IP address. Minus minus type equals load balancer will effectively give us an external IP address as well. And we're going to get that shortly. Uh, so if I do kubectl get services, I will see that I have a service now called PSH with a, an internal IP address. Now, any other services that I have could access that via that stable IP address. Uh, but ultimately, we will want a, an external IP address that we can connect to with our curl command that we've been using for demos. And we'll wait for that for a second. Uh, and what we'll do in the meantime is scale the application. So we have one instance running currently. Say we want 20 instances of that. We want to load balance traffic across 20 instances of that application that are running. Uh, we can do that very easily. And we use a scale command for that. So kubectl scale deployment, which is the thing that manages the containers for us. And psh, the name, minus minus replicas equals 20. We hit that. And now we can do get deployments. And we will see, and we're not going to wait for it because we're in a rush, uh, it's now spinning up 20 instances of that running container. Uh, we've got six so far. We won't wait for it, but we, we're interested in the external IP address. Uh, so we will go back to our services, get services. And now we can see we have an external IP address. OK, so we have a cheat sheet here, which makes life a little bit easier. Uh, and my curl command that we've used for the raccoon image before is here. And what we need to do is copy and paste in the IP address of the service in Kubernetes. Get back here so we can paste it. Lots of network latency. And now we can curl our raccoon image back up. The endpoint here, we have 42 as the game ID, effectively, that last part of the, the URL. And we see the results back exactly the same as before. So I right. think what, what, Mandy, what we just showed you is that you can build a standard Node.js application using Google services. We deployed that to App Engine, and it just handles everything for us. And then if you want more control, you can take that exact same container image and run it with Kubernetes also on GCE. So, yeah, exactly. And you can also run it uh, somewhere else, right? Anywhere you yeah. can run. So that's, that's very portable, isn't it? From one Google thing to another Google thing, right? It's very portable. That's very portable. I mean, yeah. that's, what more do you want, right? No, so I actually, I, heard, I was talking to people earlier, and I heard somebody mention there's this small bookseller in Seattle that has a cloud. You might have heard of them. Um, so let's switch over and show that real quick. So um, AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services, has a cloud. Uh, so I've, what I've done is spin up a micro instance. We don't need to give them much money. Um, <laughs> And uh, let's see if we can get that exact same container image running in that micro instance. So uh, what I'm going to do is SSH into that machine. Uh, and hopefully, I can connect. The network is dead, bro. Oh, network is fun. Let's, OK. Let's move on. OK. So um, I can connect into this machine. And what I'm going to do is um, I'm just going to run it in Docker. So nothing is uh, running right now. So what I can do is uh, I'm going to uh, use this Docker run command. Uh, actually, I'm going to do a Docker pull first. And so what this is going to do is go out to the container registry, download that image onto this local machine. Um, we're just wrapping the Docker command with gcloud for authentication. There's other ways to do authentication, but it speaks the exact same uh, Docker wire format. 
Uh, and then what we're going to do is run that Docker container right here on EC2 image. Now, we could have shown that with Kubernetes on EC2. That works beautifully as well. We could have also shown it with Mesos. That works well. We could show it with EC2 container services. But we just wanted to show the very base level thing, which is just a Docker image. And so um, to do that, I'm going to use this run command. And it's kind of a little bit fancy because it has to handle the authentication. So it passes in authentication credentials. Uh, and there we have it up and running. And now we're going to see if that exact same EC, uh, instance will work. See, I'm hitting it in EC2 uh, from my local machine. And we should get the identical results. So what do you think? Portability? No? OK. It, it, it is the same raccoon, believe me. It's the same raccoon. It really is. OK, so now what we showed you is built. we built the app in Node.js. We deployed it to App Engine, to Kubernetes, and to an EC2 instance. Now let's talk about when your application's in production. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that I worked on an Alpha 2 version of the application that I think is a lot better. But I'm hearing some complaints from users that there may be some latency issues with my version. And I don't think it's true because I write good code. So we can go in. Um, and there's a, a tool in the cloud platform called Stackdriver Trace. And it's an RPC profiling utility. And it tells me where every millisecond of latency in the application goes. So uh, you can see all these requests are happening uh, live right now. Uh, I'm going to go in, though, and drill in on one particular report. So Trace does these, has these reports views that lets you compare two different releases and look at their latency. So you can see the uh, version Mandy built, alpha one's in blue, and the version I built is in orange. And yes, and then the x axis there is latency in milliseconds, and the y axis is percent of overall requests. And so what this is showing is a standard distribution of latency, as you would expect from any distributed system. Um, Mandy's is centered around one second, and mine is centered around three seconds. So I think you may be right, Mandy. I think there may be something wrong with my version. Um, let's drill in and see if we can understand why. I'm going to look at a sample trace from one of Mandy's. Um, and you can see here a breakdown for one particular request. It breaks down every millisecond of where the time is spent. So there was times, a little bit of time spent, 44 milliseconds in metadata call to the GCEVM. That's probably authentication. There was 50 milliseconds um, sent in cloud storage, and then 242 milliseconds in the Vision API. So you can see that this view gives you an intuitive understanding of how much those RPCs you're doing uh, cost. But overall, that looks really fast, Mandy. Uh, let's go and take a look at one of the slower ones from mine. And you can see it's a lot longer, and there's a lot more going on. Um, in particular, there's this do questionable initialization uh, method in there. Did you write that? That, that may be questionable. And you can see what it's doing is it's doing a bunch of chain calls to the Vision API, I mean, to uh, Twitter. Um, so that was, that's clearly a mistake that I made in my app. Um, luckily, as a developer, this tells me exactly where to go. Um, scavenger hunt, uh, line 11. So that's right in here. And you can see, sure enough, we're calling Twitter in here. Clearly something I should work on right after this demo. This isn't in the app you're trying out, by the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that one's not pushed to production. OK, um, the next tool I want to show you is error reporting. So. Uh, you are, many distributed applications get lots of errors, but they get buried into logs that you never look at and can't find easily. What Stackdriver error reporting does is it looks in logs and it pulls out the relevant er errors. It grew, it's a very intelligent about the way it groups the errors, so it isolates them to ones that have the same root cause associated with them. Um, and then it gives you a frequency, how often is that happening, who's affected, to help you triage what to go work on. So this one in particular is type error, um, cannot read property of type name. OK, you can see it's happening pretty regularly. And we actually see a full call stack of where this is happening. In particular, it's happening in AppJS. Um, and let me just start real quick. Whoops, yeah, the debug script. Um, I'm going to just throw some sample load at it uh, that will reproduce exactly this issue. So we, we've used this tool now, and we've isolated where the problem is. Now, I could go back in the source code and look at it, but I want to show you another tool. Um, the tool I want to show you is the Stackdriver production debugger. 
So what we're going to do with the production debugger is we're actually going to look at the running state of the application while it's running. And so um, I'm going to, uh, you can upload your source code just from your local machine. You can attach a Git repo to it. Or I'm using the free private Git repository that comes with the cloud platform that you're welcome to use. Um, and you can see we have a few versions of this app. But I'm going to use the one that's, uh, that I deployed as Alpha 2. And as you recall, it was line 577. Right here is the problem, line 577. And there's a nice little helpful hint. There's a bug here. That's handy. Right, don't, doesn't your code have that? <laughs> um, and so what we're, what we're doing is we're setting a watch point. This is a lot like a breakpoint, but it doesn't break. Imagine if you had a debugger and you attached it to a running process. That wouldn't be good. This is something we use across Google and many services. Um, to debug. Oh, and I have, sorry, I have to actually debug Alpha 2. Uh, so let me just do that real quick. Uh, I was debugging Alpha 1, which is Mandy's version. As yeah, we know, her version is one, really right? good. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have the problem in it. Um, so let me grab that. OK, let's try again. Um, so, uh, so you can't really attach a real debugger. The, all the alternative is logging, right? Like if we were trying to track this down, we might say, oh, we don't have enough logging here. We need to add more logging, redeploy the app, and then spelunk in the logs again. Um, but that's also a very difficult thing to do. So instead, we can just set a snapshot. And that pauses execution of the program uh, when that call happens and then returns the results so we can take a look at it. So in this case, the problem seems to be line 57. It was something about um, can access name of undefined. So I, my guess is it's something with this labels array. Maybe the labels array is not there. But I can look at it. There's the labels array. It's got a name, flooring, and a, a confidence of 72. So that's not really the problem. Can anybody spot the problem yet? Maybe you need some more help from the cloud debugger. So we can, I am curious about what this label's length is. I have a little bit of a theory that what the problem might be. So I can set an expression there. And just while we're doing this, I'll also take a look at what that index is. So now it's going back out to all those uh, machines, and it's waiting for the first time that error happens again. And it's going to grab the stack uh, and locals and bring that back. And there you can see the length is 1 and sample index is 4. Can anybody see what the problem might be now? Come on, somebody yell. Yeah, yeah but what is it? What is it? What's the problem? Yeah, array index out of bounds. Yeah, so imagine how long it would have taken you to isolate that without the help of this, uh, this sort of tool. Uh, we can come back here. We can actually see there's the problem right there. Sample index um, is set to 4. We could have better, better code reviews, right? Better. We should really do some code reviews. Yeah, Absolutely. OK, so I think we're ready to switch back to slides now, aren't we, Mandy? Uh, I think we are. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So when, when oh. I, I showed you three tools. I showed you um, Stackdriver Trace for RPC profiling. Then I showed you Stackdriver Error Reporting to help you find out what's really going on in terms of errors. And I saw, uh, showed you the production debugger. And so I think Mandy's going to wrap us up. OK, so quick wrap up. Uh, we have a, I like these things. I like walking around and prowling stages. Uh, so yeah, so we have a quick wrap up. Uh, we have lots more to come when it comes to Google Cloud Platform here. Uh, what we've shown you today, Brad has talked to you about how Google Cloud Platform is a different kind of cloud, it, how it differentiates effectively. We've also walked through how you can have a productive local development experience using uh, the, the very simple tooling that we have. All the things we ran locally uh, ran, run in standard tools. We were running NodeMon and NPM and such like to, to run our application before we deployed. Uh, we also have demonstrated many of the flexible deployment options. Uh, basically coming from having container images. Uh, we can deploy that same container image to App Engine, uh, to Kubernetes, or to anywhere you can run a container image. Uh, and also, Brad finally shows you how <laughs> we can greatly reduce the time to fix. And there's a lot more to it as well. Uh, Brad talked earlier about this being the third wave of cloud platforms, of cloud computing. And I think that's never really been more apparent than when it comes to data analytics with Google Cloud. Uh, we have a very, very extensive portfolio of products when it comes to data analytics. We wanted to demonstrate them today in context of the application, but we just didn't have time. It turns out we have more time than we thought. Okay? <laughs> uh, so what we decided to do, and also we're really good at doing 
this data analysis. We've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, so we have an extensive suite of tools uh, that you can use. And we have some talks at Google I.O. that will cover these in detail. So we have uh, Kaz is going to talk about how to build a, a smart Raspberry Pi bot uh, using the Cloud Vision API and also the Speech API later today. Uh, also, there's making sense of IoT data with the cloud uh, from Ian Lewis later on uh, on Crater. And also, uh, tomorrow in the afternoon, we have Dominic Proust, who's talking about scaling your data from concept to petabytes. And also, on Friday, we have uh, Felipe Hoffer and Jordan Tigani, who will be talking about the election. Uh, and hopefully, having shown you how data can predict the results of elections. I'm hoping that they won't be uh, predicting the result of the election, but <laughs> they'll show you how you could potentially do it. And ultimately, that's it. But also, we have another session at 3 o'clock this afternoon. The next session, we're trying to link them all to drive you there so you know where to go next. So if you're next Google Cloud Platform talk, go to uh, Crater Stage uh, at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, Arja Hamily is going to be talking about just enough stack drivers to sleep well at night, which kind of ties back into what uh, Brad has shown you. We also have Code Labs. Uh, so if you're interested in getting hands on with all of this stuff that we've shown you today, including the Vision API, then you can go to the Code Labs area. Uh, we have eight Code Labs. Uh, you can come and see us on the Cloud Sandbox. We have uh, the Emoto booth running, which uh, we first featured at GCP Next. And that will effectively detect facial expressions. And it's a really, really cool demo. Uh, and also, we have the BigQuery Query It demo, which, again, is also cool. You can play with your friends. Uh, and it shows you how BigQuery works. And finally, we have Cloud Office Hours. So we're probably going to run out of time for questions. We should be able to take a couple. Uh, but if you have any burning questions or want to discuss anything uh, in depth with experts, uh, Brad and I will also be there as well. Uh, you can come to the Cloud Office Hours today at 5 o'clock, tomorrow at 1 o'clock, and Friday at 9 a.m. And All right. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Cheers.